What I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about the importance of addressing the physical inactivity epidemic. I know that this crowd understands that and that a lot of you have already gotten in some morning exercise. My morning exercise was getting to you today. but. Um, and I'm going to talk about using technology and theory-based interventions to promote physical activity. And then I'm going to talk a, about a, a lot of my more recent work over the last 10 or 15 years, taking these strategies and techniques and use of technology and applying it to underserved populations, the populations who we haven't reached um, very well and um, that are a growing and very important part of our population. <coughs> So what's the problem, as we all know, is this really epidemic of physical inactivity. And you know, when we think about changing behavior, I think it's really important that we talk about behaviors, because behaviors are something we can change. Sometimes when we talk about, how many of you have heard the phrase, the obesity epidemic in the media? OK. So that bothers me because obesity isn't a behavior. I can't help you with your obesity. I can help you with your eating, and I can help you with your activity. And obviously, all of us in the room know if we help increase physical activity and increase healthy eating, we will be addressing the obesity epidemic. But sometimes patients that I work with, when you say obesity, they just like throw up their arms, like, I have this obesity. You know, like, I have this disease, and what are you going to do, doc, to help me fix it? As opposed to empowering people to do the hard work to eat more fruits and vegetables, watch what they eat, and, and get physical activity every day. So I think our goal is to address this epidemic of inactivity. Um, so we know here that physical inactivity is, the is one of the leading causes of death worldwide. So we focus a lot on enjoyment and well-being and those concepts. Um, and, and those are all obviously critically important. And those may be the things that get people out of bed every day to be active. But the fact that it's such a large cause of death is something to think about. And we all know about it as an independent risk. So it appears to be, um, have an impact comparable to smoking. So again, you know, continually reminding people that sitting on the couch is doing something not all that different than smoking um, can be motivating to people, particularly at teachable moments in their life when they're ready to make a change. Um, or when they have a family member who's had a heart attack or something else that reminds them about their vulnerability. Um, and, and you know, we have different ways in physical activity and in surveillance to count how many people are active. And it depends if we use a self-report measure or an accelerometer and a variety of other ways. Um, but the estimates are that 20 to 50% might be doing what we want. And so we have a long way to go. So we hear more and more in the media um, about inactivity and, and its risks. Um, and we hear about that both in terms of its connection to o overweight and obesity and independently. And if we look nationally at, at who is engaging in no leisure time physical activity, you can see that there's certain parts of the country, and you all can be looking at this for maybe where you um, either are from or where you're currently working, and you see certain pockets um, where, where there are, you know, we're a little bit better off in, in the west and in some parts of the east, and then there's places in the, in the south particularly um, where there are very low numbers of people, high numbers of people who engage in no leisure time activity. And then we see, again, pockets where people are meeting the guidelines, okay? Um, but still, even in, even in the best of circumstances, we don't have very many people meeting the guidelines. And if we look specifically by both sex and by race and ethnicity, th this is where things get even more you know, troubling. So you can see here um, among, among both men and women this sort of dose response, if you want to call it, or just the, that the low rates get even lower. They're lower among women, and they're lower um, for people who are more underserved in terms of race and ethnicity. And, and that's a big reason why a lot of my work has turned in that direction. So our goal is to figure out how to replace inactivity with activity. And I also think that 
fun isn't an unimportant concept. I think we all know, all of you, you know, many of you are, are out there as practitioners, and that we're not going to get somebody to wake up day in and day out to do something that they hate. I can't tell you how many people I've worked with run, or when you ask them, what, what do you do, or what have you ever done, they'll say, I run, and I hate it. And then I'll say, well, then why do you run? Let's find something for you to do that you like to do, right? Because that seems like a really important place to start at getting people to make change. Or if you don't like to run, could you run with the person you like to be with? Or could you run in a beautiful place? You know, what could possibly make it something that feels good to you and you want to do? Uh, because we are, you know, up against this thing, right? Unlike a lot of other health habits, we do really want people to make this change and then sustain it forever. So it, it, for those of us that do it, it doesn't seem like that big of a deal. But you know, for somebody who doesn't, it, it is a big deal. And we have to figure out the right way to package it, especially if we want it to be sustained. Because what we know is so many of our programs, even if we get people to come for six weeks, 12 weeks, whatever length it is, they don't keep it up after, afterwards. So the media talks, has talked about physical activity more and more, connecting it to the brain, connecting it to, to um, other kinds of things. And so I think that the national conversation is, couldn't really be better for the kind of work we're all engaged in. How many have heard of the National Physical Activity Plan? OK. If you haven't heard of it, I encourage you to go on the website and, and check it out. Um, this is about strategies and techniques to increase physical activity and has gotten a lot of national attention. And you can see here, I wonder if I can do, no, it doesn't work there, okay. Um, if you look at the, um, the strategies, some of the strategies have turned to mass media. And thinking about how we partner with communication experts to develop mass media messages. So we need to build our local programs, but we need the larger conversation and the big mass media message to get out to people as well. And also in the plan, there's a lot of discussion about using social media and using technology. Um, and we can use technology as part of assessment and surveillance, surely, but we can also use it as part of our intervention in our program. So what is technology? Some of you look too young to remember what one of these was. OK? Um, but we've certainly come a long way with all our gadgets and all that. And you know, my, my oldest kid is 25, and my youngest is 12. And the 12-year-old is like a, you know, talking to me last night about, you remember when you people used to use flip float phones? She's talking about those like they were this, or you know, horse and buggy, or something like that. So anyway, technology moves really fast. And for those of you working in the area or who want to, you know, one of the things is that like, by the time you write your proposal for whatever you're going to do, never mind wait to get it funded, it's going to be outdated. That is the nature of technology. And so we have to figure out what pieces to harness that will have some lasting power and just recognize that you might need some adaptations on the way as technology changes. So there's lots of applications to techn of technology to fitness. Um, using your, the phone, using apps, et cetera. Now, we all know that the best exercise program is one that people will use. And part of the infiltration of technology and physical activity for tracking and all that is that, you know, we're trying to make it accessible and available and always with you so that people can be reminded of that. When we think of websites, we think of wanting to make them sticky, right? We need people to keep coming back to them. And so similarly, having devices and apps on people's phone may be a way to keep it present for them. So as we think about using technology, again, for interventions, we can use them as the delivery tool with text-based messages and web-based messages. We can use it to customize. How many have heard of precision medicine, personalized medicine concepts? OK, as we apply that to physical activity. Um, you know, we want it to be personal, and we can, we can customize things on the fly using technology. Um, and of course, we can use it as measurement. So um, in the, um, hopefully people have seen, there's been two big Lancet series on physical activity. They came out in 2012, um, and then more recently, I guess 2016, before the Olympics. 
And so, um, you know, there'll be another one coming in 2020 where we kind of highlight some of the key research findings and trends. And in that, um, one of the papers led by Mike Pratt talking about technology and dissemination, the focus was on that we need to reduce the need for site-based site interventions. Not that they're not important, but the physical inactivity epidemic is so big that if we, we rely on site-based programs, there aren't enough of us to run these programs if we did it all day, every day. And there, for a lot of people, there's no way to get to the programs. So that needs to be a piece of the successful equation, but there needs to be other strategies too. In terms of widespread dissemination, um, also we need other approaches, and we need, we need approaches that are consistent with the times. I teach a freshman seminar and you know, I always have people play around with different physical activity gadgets, and I have them wear a pedometer and other things like that. And then even if, before I even bring it up, because I always get to the point where I give them apps and all that to work on, they're like, why am I wearing this device? Why don't I just use my phone? So if we want to make something relevant, particularly say for young adults, we have to be somewhat aware of the technology that they're used to and what's ubiquitous in their life. Because they don't go anywhere without their phone, and probably that's true for most of us. <clears throat> um, so the other thing is using, using theory. One of the things with technology is we don't want technology to guide the science, right? We have to have our ideas and our theory of how things, would, how things work and how things change, and then we use technology to get us there. Um, and so that's one of the things we have to be careful of, and some of the the grants that don't do so well are the ones where people get a little too seduced by what the latest technology is and, and they're going off in that direction without connecting it to, to theory. So in, um, in this review of papers, it says overall web-based interventions show small positive effects. However, on the basis of our review, few web-based physical activity trials have used program features specifically matched to theoretical constructs. So that's what's key, is taking the best of the technology with the best of the theory and applying it. So just a quick review. Uh, many of you are familiar with these. These are some of the different theories and models that have been used in physical activity research, some focusing more on helping with individual behavior change, some with interpersonal behavior change, and some with environmental. And of course, we need to really be focusing on all three of these levels if we're thinking about you know, population change. And, and just for a review of a couple of the models that I'm going to be discussing, the stages of change model, the key concept is that when people are attempting to make behavior change, they move through different stages and their level of motivation varies. Um, and so that's why it's also sometimes known as um, the stages of readiness to change. And then there's processes of change, which are the strategies and techniques that we can help people with to make change, like goal setting, for example. Um, that people ha see things as pros and cons. There's good and bad about change, right? Like, and I was using that example early on. If you hate to run and you're not willing to find another activity, and so that's a con, then what's the pro is you get time with a good friend or a family member, or you get to go to a beautiful place. And about self-efficacy is about building people's confidence to be successful we find that you have to build somebody's confidence that they can do something. I mean, it's not just like the old Nike ad of just do it, right? It, you might need to think about it and plan for it and then do it um, in order to be successful. So again, as we think about the population, we have people in that stage one who are inactive and aren't thinking about doing anything. These are probably the most important people for us to try to reach, but they're really hard to reach in one of our programs where we were trying to get this group, and we said, hey, even if you don't want to be in our program, just mail in your um, application or sign up on the web, and we'll send you a free t-shirt for doing nothing, just to kind of find out, are they even out there? And, and we, couldn't, we only got two people even to do that. So this group is really hard to, to, hard to reach, and we need to have our public health messages, and probably our physicians in the community um, keep mentioning the importance of physical activity so it gets on people's radar screen enough that they will at least be in stage two where they're considering making change. You know, for physical activity, I think we can learn a lot from looking at what's happened with tobacco. And so if you think about physicians' role in helping people 
quit smoking, the literature shows that it usually takes at least seven different times that a physician has brought it up with their patient that they should consider quitting before there begins to be change, or there, and certainly before lasting change. So that's a lot of persevering over a number of years to get people to move along enough out of a stage one into a stage two. When they're in stage two, they're inactive, but they're thinking about making change. And when they're in th stage three, they're doing some activity, but not much. So often we find people who do something on the weekend, but that's all. And those stage two and three people are really the, the targets of most of our programs. Social cognitive theory, which many of you have, you know, are familiar with, is this interaction between behavioral attributes, personal characteristics, and the environment, and all of those three interacting to help people make change in their in their activity, and and those two um, programs to, theories together have guided a lot of the work that we've been doing. So as we turn to look at um, physical activity interventions in underserved populations, one of the things notable is that most of them are site-based. Um, in the Latino community, both on the East Coast and here, for example, many of them use promotoras, people from the community to help guide programs, a fabulous way to go. But again, the problem is there's not enough promotoras, there's not enough community sites to get everybody to be active. And we need to go beyond that to figuring out how we get people active in their community. In terms of, of matters like sustainability, dissemination, cost, logistics, um, you know, we need to go beyond those. And so again, if we think about a multi-level approach, we need the community-based programs. We need all the classes any of you and anybody else can run and are running. But we need other things to supplement those for people. <clears throat> so this is just a little bit about how we've adapted some programs over the years um, using you know, federal grants to first off take the face-to-face -face experience of counseling and goal setting and individually working with people and build it on the computer so it's disseminable. And then we've been doing research with um, print-based approaches, telephone-based approaches, web-based approaches, and more recently, text message-based approaches, um, initially all in English, and then more recently, many of these studies in Spanish. Um, and also, so the, the main groups we've been adapting the programs for are for Latinos, again, on the East Coast, and here in, in, um, the, on the West Coast, as well as in uh, a partnership with our colleagues in Alabama, and then also for African-American women. Um, these are the two main groups, but there are many more groups that these adaptations um, could, could work well for. We've also worked with um, pregnant women and women at risk for gestational diabetes and recurrent gestational diabetes with a partnership with um, UMass School of Public Health and Lisa Chase and Tabor's group. So we've, we've developed print-based materials initially. And by the way, you know, technology isn't always the best. We were re recently get, starting some work here with Latino men, and we made an assumption based on some of the other work we were doing that they might prefer technology-based interventions. And they're like, mm, not really. Kind of rather get just some stuff in the mail, give me some advice. I don't want the intrusion all the time of all those text messages. Um, and so we did the first study print-based. We, afterwards, the guys told us, you know what, actually that would have been helpful. Some reminders, not too often, maybe two or three times a week. Again, it was good that we asked. We were going to send them a couple times a day. So, you know, I think that that's one of the messages in research. You need to talk to people in your community. You need to, you know, look at the literature, see what's been done, think about what makes sense, and then go and do a survey, do focus groups, do interviews with the actual population you want to reach re real time, right before you're going to go launch your program, and make sure they're going to come. Because if they're not going to come, if they, they're telling you that what you're proposing doesn't make sense, um, you know, in the case with the men and women here earlier on when we were starting to wanting to pilot work with text messaging, they just said, look, I'm at work. When I get a text message, I think it might be something important. It might be my family trying to reach me. It might be my kid is sick or my aging parent needs me. So I'll look at my phone and I might get in trouble at work. So I don't want your text messages telling me to walk. So again, you know, talk to your, talk to your population before you dive in. So again, we early on did some work looking at telephone versus print-based interventions to promote physical activity, um, and found that both 
approaches, again, this is in Providence, Rhode Island. This is physical activity per week, which is pretty scary, right? People don't exercise. Um, and we found that both the print and the telephone based significantly improved physical activity. But we found during the maintenance that the print actually continued to get better, which we didn't expect, and the telephone fell off some. And so we think part of what was happening there was that the, when we, we had less contact with people, because we have more contact, we had 11 contacts with them over this period, and then only three during this period, the telephone people didn't have the materials and skills, and they weren't as independent because they had been used to the telephone coaches. So when the telephone coaches weren't there anymore, then they started to fall off some. Whereas the people who had to be a little more self-reliant using the, the customized print um, were able to keep their activity going. So just something to think about. And then we, you know, we follow these different um, calls from proposals from the NIH. And a, as I mentioned, you know, the NIH has been interested in adaptations to underserved populations. As you know, in heart disease and many of our other diseases, uh, unfortunately, all the early research was done you know, on white men. And then there were ad ad the, the treatments were adapted to women and to to non-white populations, and sometimes it was not the best idea because the way hard, um, cardiovascular disease works, et cetera, it tends to be different in the kinds of treatments and need for early detection. Um, so it's really important that we're doing research in diverse populations. We began our research with Latinas um, doing focus groups and, and coming and really doing listening and hearing about the themes that were the barriers. And some of these are themes that we hear from other groups, and, and some of them were different. We heard about weather and safety and stress and money and access as primary areas. And then we went on to do a first a small study to address um, address what we heard and adapt the program. And so we we did an adaptation. So. You know, translating to Spanish, of course, is necessary, but not sufficient for reaching a community. We need to look at cultural values um, as well. And then we did a pilot study after, after our, our adaptation. So we took all of our print materials. We looked at the theory-based components that were important about goal setting, about problem solving, social support, rewards, managing barriers. We, this is, um, a, a customized print report that goes over and recognizes you know, how many minutes somebody's doing, what they want to do, what they did last time, and giving them feedback, and then giving them feedback about self-efficacy and goal setting and the different strategies and techniques. So you know, we use the computer to take the thousands of counseling paragraphs we've written and pull them in the right configurations for people so that they experience via print or phone or web or text in, in the, our different studies is what, what, what would one of us would be doing if we were actually face to face with them. Um, so this gives you an example where it says, we're glad to hear from you again. We hope that these reports are giving you information that you can use to increase your participation in physical activity. Remember, it's provided specifically for you, and we focus on your change over time. And this focuses on how ready the person is to make a change. We also have tip sheets about weather, about taking your pulse. We, there's a mixture between kind of dealing with factual kinds of things and specific um, goals and strategies for change. But certainly when we take sedentary people who may not have been active for years, um, we don't make an assumption that they know how to take their pulse or understand anything about target heart rate. And if we don't tell them strategies for dealing with snow and ice and rain and extreme heat, um, then that can be a barrier. And we know that if we take people who haven't been active and we give them an experience that's frustrating and demoralizing, what's going to happen? Are they going to keep doing it? No, they're obviously not going to keep doing it. And so we don't want to um, lead them somewhere that's not going to be successful. We have people wear pedometers to, you know, typically in our programs. Um, and we have people keep logs, again, whether they're print logs, whether they're web-based logs, different ways people can, can track their activity. We know over and over again in the literature, keeping track of your activity is something that keeps you accountable and is successful. Um, giving people choice is often good, too, and saying, which way are you willing to keep track? Would you prefer this log I'm giving you? Would you prefer this pedometer? Do you want to do it on your phone? We need you to, we need you to keep track of your activity. So in our initial work um, with the Latinas on the East Coast, we found 
um, that this very sedentary group became more active over six months. Um, we had a lot of change in our comparison group as well. Um, and this group did not receive physical activity messaging. But it's interesting when you think of the name of your program, you know, this was like, let's, this program was let's get active. Um, and we thought that we were kind of leading this group on. In fact, we even had people in it who said, hey, you never gave me anything that was at all helpful. But I knew the name of the study was let's get active, so I decided to do some walking. So we need to think about that as we, as we brand our programs. Of course, maybe we should just be telling the whole world, let's get active, and anyway, that would be helpful. Um, so we continued to do adaptations. Um, they told us that offering the program in Spanish made them feel um, understood and engaged. This was on the East Coast. Obviously, when my research here, where there's so many programs available in Spanish, offering something in Spanish has has less cachet for recruiting people. But in, in New England, where a lot of them would say, hey, even if I go to a gym, there's nobody who can train me, there's nobody who can talk to me, there's nobody who can support me. Um, so, so offering it in Spanish was helpful. And they appreciated that we address some of their culture-specific barriers. For example, the women told us that the men in their lives needed to be involved. They didn't have to be active with them, but they had to know about it. And that they also wanted to protect them and make sure they were safe. And so we talked about strategies for doing that and that that was important to them. They also told us they weren't going to miss a family meal or preparation of a meal in order to exercise. So we needed to give them other ways to do that. So we can all get into and think about values and family and all that and kind of put that up on a shelf. But here we go with the participants saying, hey, this is front and center. If you want me to change, you need to help me with these things because I'm not going to change these things in my life. Um, so then we um, applied for additional funds to continue this work um, and, and did a second randomized controlled trial that was a little bit larger. And um, here are our findings here where we were able to, again, show nice change and pretty good maintenance. Now, these people started very inactive. Most people were doing zero minutes per week. Um, and um, so we didn't get anybody people, we, we only got about 20 or 25% to the national guidelines of 150 minutes. Um, but we did show very large um, increases in physical activity. And again, we were pleased that, that they were maintained. So taken together, those studies show that we can take a theory-based um, program and adapt it both culturally and linguistically, um, and that the print-based intervention seems to work and, and could be something that could be disseminated. So let's move on to the web. Um, an important area for reaching people, one of the things about doing web-based interventions is that once you develop it, which is complicated and expensive, disseminating it, it doesn't matter if there's 10 or 10 million people in it, it doesn't cost you any more money. So that's something to think about in terms of implementation of these programs locally, nationally, globally. Um, that uh, even a print-based intervention, or certainly a face-to-face -face intervention, you, they, you know, you need to continue to pr pay for that person's time. Um, so th that's part of the appeal. We did an initial um, R01 grant developing our intervention and looking at it relative to a print-based program. This was a study called Step Into Motion. And we were looking at randomizing people to a tailored internet group compared to the tailored print that we had already shown was effective. And in this case, we kind of took print material and put it up on the web. It didn't have all the bells and whistles of, of a, what you all would consider a regular website. Um, we were controlling for content to really test channel of delivery to see if the web was as effective. This is about 15 years ago we did the study. Um, you know, we created an online physical activity tracking calendar. Um, self-monitoring and goal setting so people could keep track of their activity, look at how they had done each week relative to the prior week, and each week what they had done relative to their goals. Um, we had a peer update system where people could send messages to each other and be told how they were doing relative to others in the group. So it's great, you've increased by 15 minutes this week. Overall, people in the program have increased by 30 minutes. Maybe you can take on some additional steps next week, those kinds of motivational messaging. We had a tip of the day. One of the things we've learned is 
The more people come to the website, the better they do, just like for our programs, right? The more times they come in, the better they do. On, you know, this is the part of science that's not rocket science, right? It does make sense to most of us that if you come in more, you're going to do better. But that doesn't mean it's easy to get people to come in. Again, the personalized report. Um, was delivered to them over the website. Another, another difference via print is that as soon as they finished answering the questions, like this was some, uh, for example, questions about social support, then right away their feedback comes up on the screen to give them some strategies to go work on. Um, and so in that initial, initial study, we were able to show again that this tailored internet group did just about as well as our print, our print group um, both of them had a little fall off and both did better than our other standard internet condition. So an, an alternative here for sure um, as a web-based approach. And again, as we took this to focus on underserved populations, initially the literature was showing that people of lower income or more diverse backgrounds had less access to technology. It was called the digital divide. But what we found over time is that actually the digital divide is going away. And globally, lower SES populations are actually earlier adopters, particularly of mobile phones. Um, in fact, there are many populations of low-income people, refugee populations, et cetera, that a mobile phone is the only way to reach them. So, so that digital divide um, ha has really gone away. Um, and as you see, internet use, for example, be, you know, increasing so over, over this time period where it's, it's becoming uh, more and more um, available to everybody. Um, so we moved into doing a web-based intervention with Latinas, and we did that study here in San Diego. And so the idea was to take the, the previous programs, everything we had learned with our print-based work with Latinas, and everything we had learned with our web-based work in general, and apply it to a program here. <clears throat> so again, adaptation both in terms of, of language. We were, the participants told us they wanted us to build more community boards, that we, they wanted the visuals on the website to be more of them, that they wanted it to be us to be featuring predominantly Latinas on the website. In our, in our photos, we had one of our investigators, Dr. Marquez, whose picture comes up here. And whenever we're asking for data from the participants, and, and she's somebody that they met, so we were trying to create a personal experience with only one face-to-face -face contact and all the rest on the internet. Again, here's goal setting, the calendar, um, daily tips. One of the things people said is, hey, if you want me to come to your website every day, make it different. I want to see something different every day I come. Yeah, well, that was a good thing to learn. So we had, a, you know, there were all the static areas that they could go back to and learn about trails and walking and safety and all those things. But every time they came, they could also, they would also get a new tip of the day. <clears throat> Their personalized report. I, I'm again using visuals with print and web-based interventions. I think is really important to connect them back to the programs. We've done this with our physician-based work, too, where the picture of the physician comes up on the mail that goes out. So it's a reminder, whether it's about hypertension management, diabetes, physical activity, this is your doctor advising you of this. And, and so here are our findings of, again, a very sedentary group of people um, in our intervention group. Again, not meeting the national guidelines, but surely doing a lot of change. And we've just received um, word that this study is going to be renewed for um, another four or five year period and we're going to make some additional adaptations and then study people out to two years here because we don't really know what's happening between 12 and 24 months. Um, so if we look at, again, megatrends in information technology and if we think not just locally but nationally and globally, um, it, this is what's really leading us to doing more work on the, on the mobile phone. Um, you can see the, the population differences here, you know, um, really decreasing between who has access to a mobile phone and who uses it. And this is true particularly, this is true, if you, you know, if you look at the different categories here with any cell phone and also smartphones in particular. Um, and, and this is the population that has a cell phone but not a smartphone. And these data become outdated pretty quickly, um, but certainly for cell phone use, cell phone availability is, is ubiquitous at this point. Um, one of the things we learned on our web-based intervention was that the people wanted were, were going to access it mostly on their smartphone. So that's just something to be aware of if you're doing things on the web. You really need to 
build them. You know, you can have all these fancy bells and whistles and when you're thinking about a big screen, but you really have to make it also adaptable if somebody's interacting from their phone, which is how most people interact with them. So let's think about text message interventions. Again, mobile phone and smartphone use. This is just in the United States. Um, globally, it, it, it is not all that different um, in terms of cell phone and smartphone use. Um, and, and we turned our attention here to studying um, minority men. Um, we went to our local community groups here, and, and they told us that it was great that we were doing all this work on women, but that we weren't doing enough with men, and they were talking about inactivity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer. They were also talking about the huge issues of stress and depression. And so while we were not directly focusing on stress and depression, um, doing interventions specifically focus on that, we all in this room know how helpful physical activity can be in, in managing, managing that. But again, for you all in your communities, go to your community groups and figure out what is the need in the community and how, let that guide some of what you're going to do, particularly for the students here in terms of having an innovative project that might, that might get picked up. So we started off with qualitative work with the men, and then we did a feasibility study. You know, oftentimes you need to just do a feasibility study. Can you recruit? Can you retain? Can you show some change before you can get larger funding to do another study? And so here's, here's our study, and you can see, again, that these men had a lot of change in just 12 weeks using um, a text message, print and text message-based intervention. Actually, this part was just print-based. Um, and also that one of the things we found with the men is it's been very hard to recruit the men in the study, but they all stick with the program. Their engagement is high, and this was just 10 men, but they were all there at the end for the measures. So that led us to kind of going on. Again, our qualitative work told us what they said. There was a preference for team sports. They wanted their programs in Spanish. They did not want it to conflict with family time. Um, that they weren't going to do that. They wanted family-oriented messages and ways to bring their family into the activity, if possible. Um, and they told us that they weren't going to spend money. They didn't have the money to spend on being active. Again, we applied for um, federal funding. This was a, a specific call for funding for racial and ethnic minority males. Um, and then this is the study that we're just finishing up right now. We did, again, focus groups the first phase, and then we did a, a, a small um, a small study. We have 48 men in the study. We're finding, again, it was very challenging to get the men into the study. Almost all of them are staying engaged, um, and we, you know, we've only lost one, I think, um, at the, at the six-month outcome. <clears throat> you know, this is just an example of the kind of text messaging, uh, having people go through. We have them text us what their, what their goals are and what their minutes are. That part's interactive, and then we also have some tips um, and positive reinforcement. So again, we were gonna do all these complicated things, and the guys were like, mm, not so much, that's not really what we want. Just prompt me, keep me accountable. We've heard that over and over again from the men and the women. I need somebody to prompt me, I need somebody to keep me accountable. And somehow texting in their information or putting it on the website um, is that accountability. For those of you who also work in weight loss, it's kind of like getting people on the scale, right? There's, there's an accountability, whether they're recording it, however they're letting their health professional know, um, and, and that that's something that they asked for. Um, so we've continued our, our work um, also with our print-based and web-based with women building on the findings in Providence to a study that we're doing here where we are adding text message-based interventions to a print-based intervention um, for women. So it's an additive design where one group is getting the program we developed and we know works, right? Because that's how science advances. We don't have to always use a control group that gets nothing. How many times do we have to show that if you don't give people an exercise program, they're not gonna change their exercise that much? We need to have the science build on itself. So in this study, we took the program that worked and that became our new control, if you'll call it, and what we're testing is an enhanced version where we pay attention to the environment, where we pay attention to um, giving them real-time messages, where the women also asked us, they said they wanted it to be social, right? When they come to face-to-face -face programs, it's social. So how could we create a social component? So they all have the option on their phones to send out a group message, like, I'm going to walk at the beach. Anybody want to come? Or I'm going to the park. 
or I have no idea what to do. Can somebody give me a suggestion? And that's been a very active kind of thing. Our staff has monitored that, you know, because sometimes those message boards, there's, they're not really giving good advice, um, and we want to make sure people stay safe. Um, but that's been an important way to give them that ability to be social, to be connected, even if it's not just coming into our programs. And then we also get to tell them via text about community-based events. And this is all a supplement to the theory-based print intervention that they're getting that we already know works. So that's, that's an ongoing um, study. So in terms of future kinds of ways to use technology, um, they're pretty much limitless. There are studies going on with Facebook. My colleagues in, in Rhode Island have just finished a study using the We and the Connect to help people increase their activity. They're, they stuck with it during the lab-based program. They stuck with it during the home-based program. Great changes. Um, you can all think of all kinds of adaptations that that could be for um, the populations you work with. It could be for older adults. It could be for caregivers who want to be active but need to be at home taking care of a, an aging family member with Alzheimer's disease or taking care of a young child. Um, there's ways to be, at, and clearly there's also ways to make it fun and connect in the family. So I think the opportunities for across the age, life stage, socioeconomic status for using technology to reach out beyond what we can do in our programs and also to get people excited enough, we sometimes find that they use these technology and print-based programs and then they're like, you know what, I'm going to join the Y or I'm going to go join a program because it builds their confidence enough that they can be active, that they want to come out and go to group-based programming. So it can kind of work both ways. So in summary, hopefully I've shared some of the approaches um, and the importance that um, our approaches evolve with societal trends, and that's a particular reason for technology, um, that we can deliver, develop and deliver um, tailored, customized interventions for people, giving them the feedback they specifically need, um, and hopefully that will get them involved and keep them involved and that there's some promising approaches for targeting underserved populations, and there's a lot more that we can be doing in this area with racial and ethnic minorities and with clinical populations and lower income populations. Um, and then, as I said at the beginning, we need technology to partner with, not replace our theory-based interventions, and, and, and make sure that the science is guiding the use of technology, not the technology um, guiding the science. So thank you and enjoy your time here in San Diego.